going to talk about AI. Uh, that is the, the focus of my presentation. It's a major focus for us in the foundry industry. Um, but I'm not just going to talk about it in the context of the, tech, the technology and the industry dynamics. I also want to talk about it through the lens of accessibility. So it's important for me to convey not just AI as a technology, AI for us as a priority, but AI as something that we make accessible to the industry more broadly. Personally reflecting on the rate and pace of change in our industry right now uh, has been pretty crazy. As I reflect on my career, I've been in the industry tw roughly 25 years or so, uh, and I reflect on like for what for me were the major inflection points, the things that got me really excited about, wow, this industry's changing right now. A couple of technology ones I think of are copper, Interconnect, remember that? Like for a year, that's all we talked about. It's going to change the industry. We were finally breaking the back end constraints to, to performance. Similarly, uh, FinFETs, moving from planar devices to 3D devices, getting better control over our sub threshold VTs, enabling new applications. Huge. It's going to change the industry. On the architecture side, things like scaling up getting to one gigahertz, high five, we did it. How many gigahertz can we get to? These were major industry inflection points. On the scale out, it was one core, two core, how many cores can we pack? All of those are examples of major inflections in our industry right now. And as I reflect on the status of our industry today, we're doing all of those things simultaneously, all at once. Process innovation, things like gate all around devices, backside power, EUV lithography, they're all happening within like a one or two year period. One year period in some areas. Architecturally, we're radically changing what packaged devices look like. We're scaling in an entirely new dimension for scale out. We're no longer thinking of SOCs as systems on a chip, we're thinking of them as systems of chips. Entire data centers are now computers. We're at an amazing inflection point in our industry right now driven by the complexity of what we have to do to sustain and accelerate the rate of change. So what does that do for us in the industry? What are the industry dynamics that all of this change is creating? The first is economic. It's flipping expensive. To dig a hole and fill it with semiconductor tools to build an advanced fab today is a $30 billion investment for the privilege of making the first wafer in that fab. It's extraordinary. For any of you to develop uh, an advanced node product, you're spending a billion dollars to develop that product before you ship the first part, software and hardware. Think about the implications of that for things like the ASP of that product, the margin that product has to return in order for us to have a viable economic for the model. Some of you have already figured that out. Some of us are still working on figuring that out. But it has a major implications for our industry. Second, Despite the rising costs, the demand for what we do is growing exponentially. Just year over year, about a 1.7x in AI chips. You know this. A side effect of this cost in particular is consolidation. Consolidation and concentration. The bets that we all have to make are so big that only a few of us are actually still able to make them. That drives lots of single points of failure in both our supply chain and in our development processes. The complexity of what we're doing is also driving extraordinary energy demand. The AI chips that have been deployed just in the last year for AI server chips, the chips themselves will drive six terawatt hours of power consumption. It's extraordinary. I'll talk a little bit more in a second about what that means for the industry. Structural shifts in what our customers, many of you, many of the advanced node customers in the industry need. For generations, our industry has been defined by the mobile space, right? The thing you all have in our pocket really drove so much of our semiconductor cycle. We all knew when the capacity needed to go online. We all knew the customers that would be consuming that capacity at the early part of the node. We knew whether we were in the mobile business or not. If we were in the mobile business, we knew because that's what our product cycle was. If we weren't in the mobile business, we knew because that's when we could possibly get some wafers finally. It was the cycle that drove our industry. And also, appropriately, the mobile companies were driving many aspects of the technology definition. DTCO, optimized for mobile, really was the driver of our industry. The shift in AI uh, right now, we can actually hear the pendulum swinging. 
AI chips or, or uh, data center chips right now are actually exceeding the demand for mobile devices right now for the first time in many, many, many generations, probably since the PC era, frankly. Pervasively across the market, we're also seeing a shift from monolithic products to multi-chip products, enabling cost optimization and scale that frankly would not be possible in monolithic designs. You, know, you see that in your designs very regularly. And finally, in the area of data center compute in particular, where there's extraordinary demand for compute capacity and an extraordinary diversity of the workloads that need to run in the data center, we're seeing an increase in vertical integration. And for us as a foundry, what that means is our customer set is changing. You know, at the leading node, less than, count them on your fingers, percent of wafers were going to, to true vertical integration. Over the next few years, we project that to go into the double digits. So it's a new set of customers doing new things with chips. I do want to talk about a couple of constraints and challenges in our industry right now that we have to acknowledge. We've been talking about power for decades, right? Power. 20 years ago was about thermal control. It was about managing quality and reliability of our parts in a box. We talked about airflow. 10, 15 years ago, power meant mobile. It was about battery life. We were very focused on how long could my battery operate with my phone in my pocket or while I'm watching videos. You, know, you still see that as the benchmark for, for power on most semiconductor devices today. However, power in the future is going to be defined by the chips but also by how much electricity can our customers actually deliver to those chips. This is, frankly, the area we may see gating the growth rate of the semiconductor industry over the next three to five years. We may see that demand for silicon is constrained by the ability to deliver electricity through the big boxes of buildings that our chips are going into. We're talking to our customers about this now and actually having to do some pretty creative things to try and solve power problems for our customers. It's extraordinary, the dynamics in the industry right now. Last point on scaling. You've probably all seen this in some form or other, but it's incredibly relevant to where we need to focus our innovation as an industry in the coming years. First, simultaneously scaling up and scaling out at the same time is very, very challenging. This is a visualization that has been cited many times. It's from, from a paper in the IEEE journal. It does a great job of it. It shows the historical, so looking back 20 years or so, is that, you can see it. Looking back roughly 20 years ago, the rate and pace of compute, and that's an orange at the top. Continuing at a pretty standard, a lot of innovation here, but driving at about 3x every two years uh, for the last 20 years or so. The green line underneath it is DRAM, access to memory, DRAM bandwidth in particular. And that's been increasing about half that rate. And the third line below it is the increase in connectivity, interconnectivity between systems, predominantly things like Ethernet or PCI. As these diverge, the systems that our chips are being used in are coming out of balance. There's an incredible paper that Google wrote uh, that, that defined a metric called model flop utilization in training models. And today's general state-of-the-art training models, sort of, you know, if you look at the right edge of this curve here in 2024, 2023, is about 30% is a reasonable benchmark according to that paper right now. So that means in training, when we're really deploying the most advanced compute capability that we have in the world, we're only utilizing about 30% effectively of the flops that we spent all that money, attention, and effort into getting into our silicon. If you blow that forward, it actually gets even more challenging. If you look out to the next 10 years, if you average the projections that you see, we see a demand for about 60,000 x, x increase over the next 20 years. And even continuing at the current rate, that's about a 20x gap a 30x gap, excuse me, to what we think we need to deliver. So we can solve this problem by throwing tons and tons of incredibly inefficient silicon at the problem, building data centers that are consuming nation states worth of power inefficiently. That's probably not how we're going to solve it. We're going to have to do lots of other things to solve these problems creatively. So let's talk about what we're going to do going forward. At the base of this model, we need exponential growth to meet the exponential demand that we showed on the prior page. At the base here, 
if we continue current rate and pace, we can get another five to 10x of performance out of the fundamental technologies that we all work on, silicon, packaging technology. Moving up the stack, there's probably another five to 10x in improving the balance between compute memory bandwidth and networking that I should do. If we can further improve that balance, we can probably get another five to 10x improvement uh, out of our uh, workloads. And finally, um, incredible effort can go into improving the models, the AI models themselves, reducing their dependency on high precision. Maybe enabling analog compute for some of these applications could be enabled. Better models in general are gonna be required to bridge the gap. This is what chips look like. For many of you, I can actually hear you thinking as I'm talking, yeah, that's my chip. I'm doing that. I could do a chip like that, or that's my, even my system. The reality is across our industry, actually, there's really only a handful of companies that can do this. Yeah, you're here in the room, I, I know, but there's lots of other people in the room right now that don't have the capability to develop chips and systems of chips like this. From my position, in my view of our industry, it's critical that we make these technologies much more broadly accessible and sustainable from both a development and a supply chain standpoint so that we can drive the innovation to many, many different companies of this type of system integration so that we can stay on that curve and drive the growth that our industry is counting on. We're working really hard at, at Intel and across the industry to anticipate these innovations from semiconductors, technology devices, up through system technologies like cooling, interconnect, all the way up to the software, we're committed not just to invent these technologies, but we're committed to making them available broadly to the industry. That's a big change for my company, uh, and it's a big bet that we've made because we've bet our company on our ability to do that with all of you. I'm thrilled to be working on this. Um, I've enjoyed this opportunity to get together in a room of people like this. We really do have some extraordinary things to offer the industry and are really looking forward to partnering with you. And that's it. Thanks, team.